This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, and uh, hope everybody had a great holiday season. We had a good Christmas and a good New Year, and then you, uh, was it was Soul's birthday, like also falls on January 1st. Yep, so, that's right. Yeah. It's been nonstop parties non-stop since the last time parties we parties over we here, here at the, the Allen House. <laughs> nice, January 1. Happy yeah. birthday, Soul. And uh, well, I guess we, we, as the Cosmographia team, we took a little bit of a break over the holiday season. Uh, but we are back now, planning to continue to do our show swap with uh, live streams, at least for a little while. And uh, Mike, how was your holidays? Uh, very quiet, gentlemen. Very, very quiet. quiet. All right. How many beers did you put down there, Mike? Uh, zero. What? Oh, my God. Zero beers. Zero that beer. is not normal. Unacceptable. A little, <laughs> a, little, a little pecan brandy, however. All right. All right. All right. You, bet. <laughs> you got... You made it back on the podcast. You were almost out. <laughs> You're almost out. <laughs> Brad? Hey. Hey, happy new year. Hope 2022 is better for all of us. Yeah. I hope so as well. Randall. Line up the good stuff. Sir. What did you think of the holiday? Did you guys get any snow over there in Georgia? No, but tonight actually is the first night. It's, we've gotten down right at the cusp of freezing a couple of times, but hadn't dropped below tonight. We're going down to 28. So okay, yeah. now it's been raining like hell the last few days. Oh. Um, and, uh, but I don't think it's supposed to rain tonight. I think that rain was the leading edge of a cold front that's mm. now here. Um, so it I'm hit not me here. expecting that we're going to get any snow. Did you get any snow, Brad? Yeah. Three inches of snow up here this morning. All right. Yeah. yeah. There's, so 200 after, miles after a week of after a week of 70 yeah very unexpectedly yeah, we, christmas day and uh you know for several days after yeah it, it turned the right direction i got my snow and it'll be yeah like randall's saying uh teens up here tonight so all that all that slush will freeze it's gonna be nasty in the morning no, i'm staying fun staying put <laughs> yeah we went from uh 80 degrees on saturday to 22 degrees late saturday night yep really now that's yeah. Quite a dramatic change. Yeah. yeah. January. That was catastrophic climate change right there. <laughs> there, there you Hit go. you with yeah. the door. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> well, Kyle, you need to stop driving your pickup truck. <laughs> what? You're, con- you're contributing to the climate crisis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's like, oh, I got to go pick up mission. beers. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what sub, what subject are we tackling tonight, Randall? Well, um, since your memory has clearly failed you. Yeah, I don't remember what we did the last show. Where we talked so, about okay. <laughs> I said, so this is what happens when we go live every other week. You forget. <laughs> I realize, okay, your attention span barely, it does last a week, but two weeks? No, that's out of the question. <laughs> Throw a holiday in there. Hey, all gone. We started actually talking about the um, the phenomena known as ekperusis because we spent a lot of time uh, talking about cataclysmos, and its counterpart is ekperusis. Now, as you know well, remember, cataclysmos was the Greek term for destruction of the world by water, ekperusis by fire, which is not quite as uh, widely known as the cataclysmos, but is a pretty, pretty powerful story in its own right when you begin looking in at the, the traditions. So we ended with some quotes um, that, and you know, f- from various traditions, bi- biblical and others, that um, sort of uh, encapsulated or expressed or symbolized some something that sounds like some pretty major fire stuff going on. Ekperusis, so the, the, the root of that word is pyro, right? So uh, 
Yeah, so I guess we could just pick up kind of where we where we uh, left off, uh, and uh, might hit a couple of those quotes again. Yeah, that's what I was thinking we could do. Um, so uh, this, um, I remember we were looking at uh, depictions or carvings and such of Mithras, Mithras, and then there was like some guy off in the corner, and you're like, "What is he? What's?" What's going on with that guy? Yeah. He's falling. And then everything was all about that guy from then on. Yeah. We just did a whole... We were doing falling gods. <laughs> the, the falling, falling gods. gods. Yeah. Well, that that idea will, will be coming back to that, but we'll have a, a, a context now for perhaps understanding mm-hmm. better what that symbolizes. So, you know, uh, we could get into some quotes right away. Um from the Mayan tradition, uh, one of the codices, I neglected to put which one. There's only a handful of them that survived the ravages of the, the, the Spanish suppression of the Mayan uh, sacred tracts. You know, they destroyed pretty much every one they could find. But uh, this one says, uh, at the close of the ages, it hath been decreed the world shall be purged with a ravening fire. This is one of the great uh, modalities of global destruction that are, you know, the Mayans have a very similar concept to the Hopis that were in the fifth world and there were previous worlds that were destroyed by a variety of natural catastrophes. Then the, the Mahabharata, which is from the Vedas, and it's talking about the end of the yuga. And, you know, the yuga is one of the great Vedic time cycles. We got into that a little bit when we were talking about um, the, the world ages, the great year of the world. So here's a quote, and obviously these are all translations, but they, they I think, captured the essential idea. These all will take place at the end of the yuga. When men become fierce and destitute of virtue, then does the yuga come to an end. And the course of the winds will be confused and agitated. And, note Brad's backdrop there, and innumerable meteors will flash through the sky, foreboding evil. And then the sun will appear with six others of the same kind, and all around will be din and uproar, and everywhere there will be conflagrations. And fires will blaze up on all sides when the end of the yuga comes. And then from Brazil comes this tradition of Monan, without beginning or end, author of all that is, seeing the ingratitude of men, and their contempt for him who had made them thus joyous withdrew from them and sent upon them Tata, the divine fire, which burned all that there was on the surface of the earth. And then from the Hopi, and this is quoted out of Frank Waters' book of the Hopi, so the people went down to live Now, this is the ancestors of the present-day Hopi that's referring to. They went down to live with the ant people when they were all safe and settled. And this is underground. They're taking refuge underground with the ant people, presumably called ant people because they were living underground. When they were all safe and settled, Teowa commanded Sotuknung to destroy the world. He rained fire upon it. Fire came from above and below and all around until the earth, the waters, the air, all was one element, fire. And there was nothing left except the people safe inside the womb of the earth. And then from the Voluspa, which is from the elder Eddas of the Nordic tradition, we have this. Surt, spelled S-U-R-T, Surt from the south, comes with flickering flame. The sun darkens, O earth in ocean sinks, 
fall from heaven. And again, I will refer you to Brad's backdrop there. Fall from heaven, the bright stars. Fire's breath assails the all-nourishing tree. Towering fire plays against heaven itself. And from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 6, Therefore, and this is in referring to the curse that has been placed upon the earth that goes back actually to, in the biblical symbolism, it goes back to the curse that was laid upon the earth um, at the very in the Garden of Eden that, that was renewed by Cain's slaying of Abel, and then which came upon the earth during as uh, uh, the result of which was the great flood. So that's a theme we'll pick up sometime and, and discuss in, in further detail because it's quite interesting, this idea that a, there has been a curse placed upon um, the world. Why that curse was placed upon the world in the first place and how the redemption from that curse may take place makes for some very interesting um, considerations. So this is what it says. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. So um, then there's a, I, going back to um, Daniel G. Britton, you know, the myths of the new world, which was um, one of the early attempts to really gather, a com make a comprehensive gathering and collection of various myths. Um, this was published in 1868. It makes very interesting reading. But in there we find Daniel G. Brinton discussing um, the uh, belief systems and traditions and stories of the uh, indigenous peoples of South America. So I'll, I'll read that quote. By far the greater number of South American tribes represent the last destruction of the world to have been by water. A few, however, the Takalis of the North Pacific coast, the Uricares of the Bolivian Cordilleras, and the Mbacobi of Paraguay attribute it to a general conflagration which swept over the whole earth, consuming every living thing except a few who took refuge in a deep cave. Um, Isaiah, back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 29, verse 6, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest, and the flame of all devouring fire. From one of the apocryphal texts, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Isaiah again, for the Lord will come with fire and his chariots are like a whirlwind to render his wrath and indignation and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord shall judge by fire and, his, and by his sword unto all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So these are just examples of, and, and they could be multiplied. We, I think they're completely actually different than the uh, quotes that I read at the end of our last um, recording. And just as the idea of the world being destroyed by fire, we, uh, the thing that we tried to get into and the essential idea that I tried to, to inculcate was that at the basis, at the core of these stories, there really is a natural phenomenon. And in this case, the, uh, I mean, in the, in what we were talking about before, even though we were focused primarily on North America, um, we can find evidence from all over the planet of these gigantic floods, uh, on such a scale that if there were survivors, it's likely that they would not know or have any comprehension of how extensive the destruction had been. And I think I might've used the, um, the analogy, because you guys now have been up on top of Stepto Butte, right? Now, Stepto Butte, from what I've been able to find out, I think there are some legends associating Stepto Butte with one of the places of uh, refuge against the flood. There are certainly many stories of the, the great floods and people 
The three, three mechanisms of survival are usually the building of a great boat, an ark, right? In a lot of the Native American stories, it's the great canoe, the climbing of a high mountain or the climbing of a high tree, big tree, and they climb up the tree. And those are the three in, consistently that you find in the, in the myths and the stories over and over again. Um, but I use the analogy of, of the real world analogy of Stepto Butte. If somehow one was able to survive these floods from the vantage point of Stepto Butte, once the floods were over, you would look out over the world and you would see nothing in every direction as far as the eye could see, but a sea of mud. That's all you would see. That's, you know, everything that was in within your field of view prior to the, the flood sweeping through there would have been destroyed. And everything, the entire landscape within your whole field of visibility would have been destroyed and you would have no framework or even thinking or no perspective to understand how or where there might have been other survivors. And of course, all means of communication with any other survivors is non-existent, right? So my point was, is that, yeah, once you begin to understand the scale and magnitude of these great terminal ice age floods that swept over huge parts of the earth's surface, one could see how, you know, you might be interpreted as world destroying, not that it's again in the, uh, oversimplified version where it's a supernatural flood that, you know, drowns all the mountains of the world from some, you know, necessarily unnatural or supernatural source. And then it all disappears through, you know, in the Greek story of Deucalion, the floodwaters flowed off through this big hole in the ground. Well, the the point being is that what I'm trying to show is that you know when you strip away the the symbology and the, the moral connotations that have been juxtaposed upon these these remembrances that underlying that there were real events natural events that would have led people to believe that the entire world may have been wiped out and destroyed by a flood and so now we can when we begin to understand the magnitude the, of these paleo hydrological events. Yeah, we can say, yeah, if somebody did manage to survive that, it's very likely that they would go generations without knowing where there are other survivors, where there are other people in parts of the world. There, and there certainly were. But those people are essentially thinking the same thing. And so we now also know from looking at the Younger Dryas, the black mat layer, is that, yeah, there were extreme firestorms associated with the Younger Dryas that left, left their signature hugely over the planet. South America, North America, Europe, Middle East. Now we've discovered that the black mat layer is there. So, you know, and with the recent papers showing that perhaps, you know, the, the, the biblical legend of Sodom and Gomorrah may have roots in a real, an actual event that happened. So, that's what we're trying to get here is, is the, the, I guess you could say the working hypothesis here is that underlying all these varied stories of world destruction are really these great natural events that have occurred that have been outside the experience of basically modern people. And so it wasn't, there was no framework for really understanding when you talk about a worldwide flood, well, you know, it's, it's natural to go, well, if we go, there was a, um, you know, the, the, the Middle Eastern um, cultures had stories of floods, um, which were undoubtedly, you know, that the, the biblical story came from the, from the Sumerians, right? And the Sumerians, while it was obviously a flood in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, it was a bad flood, it was a devastating flood, but it was only a regional flood. It wasn't a, anything that was involved in, as part of a worldwide event, right? But when you start factoring in the kinds of things that we've been looking at, the, the, the massive rapid melting of the ice sheets and the rapid rise of sea level and perhaps accompanying tsunamis um, that could have wiped out entire coastal communities, you know, in a matter of hours. We see that, yeah, there can be a naturalistic basis to these flood stories. So now with that kind of a perspective in mind, coming back to the stories of the world destruction by fire, can we find anything that would suggest 
that there's a naturalistic explanation behind uh, these things like that I just read to you. And I think the answer is yes. I think that there is evidence. And the thing I just cited, you know, the younger driest boundary might be an example of that. In fact, that might be an example of something where you had floods preceded, uh, uh, floods preceded by fires. And that's kind of what it looks like. So what I've done is I've gathered together a, a collection of historical events. Now, these are all from North America, but there are others. Um, but these are the ones that I had access to. And when we did the, um, you know, I participated in that, uh, um, that documentary back that we did in 1996 called Fire from the Sky. And the whole premise of that was that uh, there might be a possibility that some of these fires were actually triggered by something, um, you know, maybe cosmic. So that's kind of the theme that we're going to pick up on. And certainly in the case of the younger Dryas, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty evident that, um, that fire was a part of the process. When we look at the Tunguska event of 1908, clearly fire was a part of that. And, and, you know, you had a couple of hundred square miles right under the epicenter of the explosion that were completely incinerated. And you had, um, you know, temperatures generated in that explosion that were close to the temperatures of the surface of the sun. So, yeah. Um, so the f first fire that I thought we would get into and talk about, um, for that, I got a, a quote of something that I wrote, um, which I think is, is germane here. Um, and just to kind of put this within a, a, a conceptual framework. Um, this is, this is what I wrote in regards to these and going through these quotes from various traditions with the predominance of biblical sources, only because of the abundance of, of ma that material available, one can discern a number of recurring themes and images. Probably the most persistent image is that the fiery destruction is a type of divine rep retribution for the misdeeds of mankind, or through our neglect of a cosmic or divine plan. As, and this was clearly made the case in the, the Hopi traditions, because this was the, the retribution the people suffered was because they basically forgot the plan of the creator, right? Or for a lack of appreciation for the compensations bestowed upon mankind by a munificent creator. Secondly, there is the recurring presence of the obvious celestial or astronomical element, as why I was referring to the backdrop, the very appropriate backdrop that Bradley has. Uh, for example, then the flo the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. That was, you know, from the, uh, or, or I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Book of Revelations. There fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. Um, innumerable meteors will flash through the sky. From the heaven fall the bright stars. So, and so on. Right. So, so my point being is that in so many of these accounts, there seems to be this clear reference to, you know, something that we would consider a cosmic phenomenon. Uh, can, here's can something I, else. Can I, Go address, ahead. can I address the, the human aspect of this real quick though? Absolutely. Cause it's a little bit, it's a little confusing to me how it seems like they're saying these things are ordained like they're going to happen and yet they're also because humans are bad right so is it like is that they're saying like this happens because people forget or they become fierce like what you read that says men become fierce and destitute of destitute virtue destitute of virtue so is that is the implication that it happens because of that or is there an implication that it's timed so that by the time that comes around the destruction happens again so we can start over with a clean slate like, I've never really been clear on what exactly the myths okay. are trying to tell us. I guess my thought there would be that in the aftermath of these events, I could see that it would be very easy for pe people to impose a religious or moral yeah. interpretation yes, on it. Yes, absolutely. And, of course, the stories are, are post-event. Right. Right? So if you've got survivors 
you know, I think that they're who are struggling to make sense out of what happened. Yep. Right now, as to the second option, yeah, I definitely think that, and this was, I think, the whole point of what we were kind of trying to get to with some of the the, the ideas we were discussing in the in the great year uh, um, framework, which is that, yeah, I mean, it does seem like there is a cyclical nature to this, right? So, um, because because that implies to me that whether we become uh, fierce and without virtue or not, it's going to happen. So it, you can't really blame it on that. But what you're saying is, is probably the survivors have, have to explain it somehow. So they explain it in this framework. And I understand r- that we've kind of talked about that on our show that, that, you know, there's this, there's this thing called survivor's guilt. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you survive something where suddenly you're like, wow, everyone except us died. What would yeah. survival's survivor's guilt drive you to do? The easiest out for yourself on that to get away to, uh, uh, from the guilt is we survived because we're good. They died because they were bad. Sure. Right. Yeah. So. Right. I yeah. Well, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, I and chosen. Yeah. And don't just don't discount the the uh, ability of religious leaders to to scapegoat. Look at Pat Robertson claiming that the hurricane on New York City was brought on by. Uh, Gays and lesbians. <laughs> oh, you mean that that wasn't the case? Yeah, I thought that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. The dinosaurs were all gay too, now. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I just, I, I also don't, um, you know, it, it would be really lucky for that kind of religious leader to survive unless they are generated by these events. In other words, it turns people into someone who would say something like that. Well, I, I find the idea of the Hopis pretty compelling, which is that basically the people got, you know, they suffered this destruction because they weren't paying attention. Right. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. not paying attention. And, and the, whole, the whole idea of, you know, think about omens. Omens are natural phenomena that are supposed, to, if you ignore these omens, you know, then you're putting your, setting yourself up for disaster. Right. But, and what's interesting is when we get into this material that we're about to get into, you are going to, I think you're going to see it th- woven throughout these narratives are, are all of these ideas. They're all there. People, you know, who, who got caught in some of these events, there were people who saw ominous, ominous from Omen, ominous yeah. forewarnings. They f- and, yes. and, and they took, uh, uh, steps to, pro- to, to, uh, increase the probability of their survival. Other people were oblivious to the omens. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that we're going to see those themes throughout this, this material, a lot of this material, you know, I'd already been researching. It goes back to, um, actually Ignatius Donnelly. And so there's kind of a, a segue off some of the early studies that I read, uh, on Atlantis back in the seventies, when I encountered this idea first presented in, um, Ignatius Donnelly's book, I think it was Ragnarok, the age of fire and gravel. And we're going to kind of get back into that idea again, uh, that he presents in there that, um, and that was, he was the first one that called attention to, uh, the idea of this, this, uh, coincidence, this extraordinary coincidence, which we're going to dive into here. So, um, I think we should just get right in, into the, uh, material going on with, with what I wrote here, um, Ancient myths and religious prophecies are replete with tales of world destruction and, cat- and catastrophe resulting from all-consuming fires. Analogous with ancient tales of universal destruction from a great deluge, only a few survivors remain in the aftermath to replenish the race. The Greeks told such tales and referred to the process of world destruction through fire as ekperusis, the counterpart to cataclysmos or world destruction by flood. The biblical account relates that the world was previously destroyed through the agency of water and will suffer destruction through fire at some unspecified future date, which is euphemistically referred to as judgment day. As with the flood story, the vision of a world destroying fiery holocaust was by no means limited to the Greeks or to the Bible, but is found in dozens of traditions from all over the world. 
Since the 19th century, academic and scholarly interpretations of the past have proceeded from the assumption of a relatively continual cultural progress from Stone Age barbarism up through ever more sophisticated examples of civilization, culminating in modern society, with an, but with an occasional interruption thrown in to satisfy the demands of evidence contrary to the gradualistic model. This idea was the lens through which antiquity was viewed by modern scholarship for the better part of the 20th century. It was not conceded that ancient humans, certainly not in prehistory, might have had a sophisticated understanding of natural law, science, or technology to any degree comparable to the present. With the dominance of this mindset, all evidence to the contrary was conveniently dismissed, ignored, or subject to modernist reductionism. However, paradigm-changing evidence amassed in the past half-century or so for a much greater complexity and depth to both human and natural history has now become overwhelming and irrefutable. If our emerging global civilization is to have any hope of surviving, much less prospering, into the future, it is critically important that we understand the past as it really was including the great periodic alterations in the state of the world that have repeatedly interrupted the forward momentum of civilization. To that end, we moderns have inherited a rich legacy of ancient knowledge encoded in multiple venues that we are only now, within the past few decades, able to realistically decipher and reevaluate. This reimagining of our human past on this planet will confer powerful insight into those forces with which our ancestors on planet Earth were challenged and increase significantly the probability that the present generation of humankind will successfully advance the great work to the next level. And then I have a quote, and this is a recurrence in teleology in Stoic physics. The great work being, in this case, civilization. Yes. Okay. To keep it in some kind of a a a, a, a manageable uh, model that we can kind of wrap our heads around. Okay. Yeah. So this is a uh, a dissertation published uh, by a Victoria Nicole Voitko in the from the University of Virginia in 1994, and uh, she had been uh, studying the Stoic philosophy, which of course is has this whole idea of, of, of repetitive uh, destructions of the earth. So she says, uh, tucked into the orthodox Stoic doctrine are two distinct theories. First, there is the claim that the cosmos undergoes cyclic destruction by fire, a conflagration or ekperusis sparked, now this is a very interesting idea, by a particular alignment of celestial bodies. Each ekperusis is followed by a period of cosmic regeneration and the spontaneous creation of a new world. That's one of the fundamental ideas in, uh, embedded in Stoic philosophy. And, and, you know, in a general sense, it's very interesting, but that one specific reference there I find really intriguing. And when we conclude looking at this mass of evidence that we're about to uh, immerse ourselves in, we'll come back to that idea. And see if there, in any conceivable way, that is a, a plausible idea that could have something to do with an astronomical phenomenon. That's just clearly um, uh, referring to some kind of an astronomical phenomena when it's talking about um, an alignment of celestial bodies. So um, here we go. We're going to go back to. Uh, 19, I mean, 1825, our first example. So here's my commentary again, from which I will read. From the early 19th to the early 20th centuries, a series of exceptionally catastrophic firestorms devastated various regions of North America. For sheer magnitude and intensity, these particular fires were unprecedented in the experience of 19th century Americans. 
and have not been equaled since. One of these fires, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, is well known to history. The rest of them remain forgotten except in the annals of local folklore. This section of the presentation, Ecperusus, documents the events surrounding these extreme fires and endeavors to show that they can be understood as microscopic or human-scale analogs of the Ecperusus of ancient, widespread ancient myths in which the world is destroyed in a cosmic firestorm. A mechanism will be suggested by which such extreme fires might be provoked. The examination will focus on six extraordinary igneous events. The Great Miramichi Fire of 1825, the Chicago slash Pestigo slash Manisti Fires of 1871, the Hinckley, Minnesota Fire of 1894, and the Bitterroot Fire of 1910. I rely primarily on the voices of the survivors and eyewitnesses to narrate the story with visual augmentation whenever possible. It is surprising that a story as powerful and far-reaching in its implications has been virtually lost to history. Perhaps this effort will be a first step in the rectification of this oversight. So, this is from, now a quote from the book by Stuart H. Holbrook, published in 1943, called The Burning, Burning an Empire, The Story of American Forest Fires. The first forest fire of catastrophic size to get into North American history swept the wild Miramichi River Valley of New Brunswick in October 1825. Although this was a Canadian fire, the worst the Dominion has ever experienced, other forest fires on the same and subsequent days were taking a heavy toll of timber and farm property in nearby Maine, and they would have received much greater prominence had it not been for the vast size and tragic results of the conflagration in the adjoining province. Now, you caught the month, right? Is it October? Yeah, October. So this was written, uh, so here is a now a quote from the Helena Independent, November 16th, 1878. Okay. And this is referring now to the Miramichi Fire. This is the 53rd anniversary of the great Miramichi Fire perhaps the most awful calamity of its kind by which the New World was ever visited. The summer of 1825 was an unusually hot one throughout North America, and the forests of Maine, Quebec, and Nova Scotia were swept far and wide by bushfires. On the 6th of October, a pall of smoke enveloped the town. That's the town of Miramichi. And in fact, the whole country of Northumberland. Now, this is in New Brunswick. On the morning of the 7th, now this is the 7th of October, the heat was fiercer. The heavens had a deep purple tint, and the gloom and sultriness were intolerable. The cattle in the fields fled to shelter as they do when a thunderstorm is about to break, and even wild animals abandoned the woods and sought the haunts of men. That's when you know something really bad is about to happen. <laughs> yeah, yes. It was quite dark at 4 p.m. At 6 p.m., lurid flashes of light, resembling those of Aurora Borealis, broke through the dense canopy. This continued until 8 p.m., when suddenly, without warning, a hurricane arose and above the bellowing of the wind came a series of explosions like a distant roll of musketry. At once, the heavens were filled with burning cinders and even brands, which, driven along by the gale, ignited everything in their path. The roar grew louder and the sheets of fire more vivid. 
At 9 p.m., the firmament was in flames. Men could not hear themselves speak for the appalling noise. It was like the rush of waters, thunder and lightning accompanied by the fires, which now surrounded the town on all sides and lit up the villages of Douglastown and Newcastle. The fires advanced with leaps upon its prey. The inhabitants were terror-stricken, thinking the day of judgment had come. And when the long rows of wooden houses caught fire, they gave themselves up to despair. A few made for the Miramichi River, where they gathered on rafts and booms, only to be engulfed by the rising water. The whole surface of the earth was on fire, and everything of a combustible nature was consumed. And then, minutes after it first struck the town of Miramichi, minutes after it first struck, the town of Miramichi was effaced. And half an hour afterwards, Newcastle, Douglastown, and the adjacent villages. The entire region to the north of the river was in flames. Flaming brands, calcined leaves, ashes and cinders streamed through the air, and the cries of the ill-fated people were lost in the dreadful confusion of the elements. And this is now quoted from the book Redcoat Sailor, the story of Sir Howard Douglas, who was the lieutenant governor of New Brunswick and major general of all the troops in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, and Prince Edward Island, as well as Newfoundland and Bermuda. These quotes are taken from his biography. From the forests south of Fredericton, a continuous roar like thunder could be heard. This was shortly followed by a, the rise of a thick column of smoke and the outburst of a series of extraordinary explosions like those caused by an artillery barrage. Giant tongues of flame shot up to heaven as if a volcanic eruption was in process. Spouts of fire rained down on the treetops, ran up and down the trunks, and kindled the branches. All along the banks of the St. John River, rows of huge trees, centuries old, caught fire and made the water beside them crimson with their reflection. Panic seized the unhappy people of Fredericton. As the hurricane began wrenching up, burning trees and boughs and hurling them through the air, the livestock of the farmers and the horses of the military were driven mad with fear and galloped crazily through the streets or along the banks of the river. Many people, being fairly convinced that the end of the world had come, threw themselves on their knees and began to pray for deliverance on the Day of Judgment. At the end of the week, when the embers had died down, Douglas announced his next step. Fetch me a good country wagon and a couple of fresh cart horses. I intend to drive through the forest and visit the outlying settlements. Now began for Douglas a heart-rending journey. The devastation he encountered far exceeded his worst fears. Most of the settlements that he went to visit had ceased to exist. His way led northward from Fredericton, till he struck the upper waters of the southwest Miramichi River. There he followed this river northeast down its course till it reached the sea just beyond the towns of Newcastle and Chatham. The total distance between these points was 150 miles. The town of Newcastle bore the main brunt of the disaster. On the same afternoon, October 7th, as the outbreak at Fed Fredericton Clouds of dense smoke enveloped Newcastle, its neighbor, Douglas Town and District, blinding and stifling its inhabitants. This was followed around 8 p.m. by a terrifying, thunderous roar coming from the neighboring forests. Suddenly, people realized that the blaze was less than a mile and a half away, and there was barely time to escape by flight. A confused mass exodus took place in the direction of the Miramichi River. Unhappily, 
At this hour, many people were fast asleep in bed. Others were lying sick of typhoid fever, of which there had recently been an epidemic. These poor people were all devoured by flames or suffocated in their sleep. Others leaped from roofs or windows of their houses, ran startled into the forest, lost their way, caught fire, and blazed like human torches. Some of the refugees found safety by launching boats on the Miramichi River and staying there till the fire died down. Others huddled under improvised shelters on the banks, half in and half out of the water. There they remained, nearly naked, exposed to the cold, and with nothing to eat for the next day and a half. The hurricane, as it gained force, made both land and water precarious. On land, it tore up burning trees and threw them about. On the water, it lashed the river into waves, snapped the anchors off of ships, and drove them on the rocks. At Chatham, in the estuary of the Miramichi, two large vessels were set alight by burning trees tossed on their decks by the wind. They blazed like floating mines and burned to the water's edge. The cattle belonging to local farmers also resorted to the river and stood there in herds with only their heads and horns showing. In one instance, a bear joined the cattle, staying there with them till the danger was finally over, and then quietly walked off without doing any harm. The fire was felt far out at sea in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The master of a sloop that traded along Northumberland Strait between the New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island coasts reported that while he was running before the gale, the heavy fall of ashes and cinders caused the sea to hiss and boil around his deck, while the smoke on his deck was so heavy and thick as to affect both his sight and hearing. And then from the New Brunswick, Canada Department of Natural Resources, the history of the Miramichi fire, and here's an eyewitness account. About eight o'clock in the afternoon, a loud roaring was heard in the woods, and from the burnt substances still continuing to thicken the atmosphere, it was so dark that the flames could not be distinguished, though they were more than one mile from the town. Immediately after, the wind blew a hurricane, a roaring noise became more and more tremendous, and seemed to the astonished people as if the earth had loosened from its ancient foundation. So I'll pause there for a second. Yeah, we need to take a break. And I have a question before we do that, too. Yeah. Do you know what's your question? Well, the question is, is when you're, you're so you're mentioning at the beginnings of these accounts, you know, several times we hear like artillery like explosions. And in that really interesting one about the sky is purple and then they see Aurora Borealis like phenomena in the sky. Yes. Yes. So my question was, is, and I, I guess I could try to research this, but do we know if that happens with modern forest? Do people re re report those like similar kinds of phenomena? I know that trees explode in big fire, so you get these booming noises. But as we go through these and we look at these yeah. comparable fires, you will see that there is are these themes of things that that no, as a rule, no. Okay. However. With some exceptions, and we're gonna, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll definitely get to that. But the aurora part made me think of uh, that part of this was maybe the sun. So it's like if you had a, you know, a comet fragmenting in the solar system and some of it was hitting the sun, some of it were running into, and you, so you've got CMEs and fragments, uh, fragments of yeah. something coming in. I mean, that's, that'd be pretty amazing but still well we'll we'll come back to this after we have gone through some of these fires because remember i had six of them that we were going to cover this yeah. is only the first one okay. so uh yeah so then 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 uh jumping back to holbrook's book on burning an empire he's also and this is i think an important idea that we see finding that we find recurring throughout these stories he says, on the 7th of October, the Miramichi country was not alone with its troubles. Far to the south, 
on the St. John River. He's talking about, and we mentioned the town of Fredericton, and I'll, I'll pull up a map here after the break so that um, people can kind of see the geographical context of what we're talking about. Okay. But yeah, so there was all the way to Maine, there was a whole series of these great, tremendous catastrophic fires that basically broke out simultaneously uh, around that evening, October 7th of 1825. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just don't understand how these accounts were even observed. You know, a giant sheet of fire came over us and burnt everything in sight (laughs) as I'm writing this story down later. (laughs) Well, well, people did survive these things, Kyle. Okay. Everyone died. He wrote it with a charcoal pencil. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll be right back, folks. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, uh, brought to you by CBDfromthegods.com. And make sure to go check out their website, and if you order something, enter the promo code RCSHIPSFREE to get free shipping. And also wanted to mention the uh, Atlantis live stream, which is a two-part special event uh, that's taking place on January 27th, 2022, 9 p.m. Eastern for part one and the 20th uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern for part two. There are two uh, three-hour lectures on the mystery of Atlantis by Randall Carlson. And well, I will be on HowTube. Yeah. I will add that um, for the fans of Cosmographia, you know, we kind of launched this whole series with a, um, some episodes on covering Atlantis, and we did a pretty deep dive into it. So... There would be some redundancy for you guys that have already heard that, but there will be some uh, some additional stuff that we didn't cover the, in that uh, that first series. There's been a few new studies that have come out that are of relevance, and it's going to be a very sort of a cogent, sort of a concentrated. It's going to hit all the high points, and uh, it would be like a for those of you that are really interested in in understanding the the details of the story. Um, it would be a good listen, uh, because I'm going to try to really put things, uh, lay out the argument, uh, in a very coherent fashion and draw conclusions from it. And then also consider the implications of that story, um, for our own modern civilization and where we're at and where we're headed in the next few decades. Uh, Because I do think that there are, uh, implications there, uh, that have come down to us. And, and so... Um, don't feel like, well, I've already heard it all, you know, because as I've said before, a lot of this kind of material, it gets, it's pretty dense and it gets pretty detailed. And so redundancy is very, can be a very powerful tool to really help, uh, grasp some of these ideas and begin to make the, the, the complicated connections that are necessary to see a coherent picture emerge. And, um, that's so, so. You know, and, and also bear in mind that, that have, this, yeah, go ahead, Brad. Well, I was just going to say that people that have friends that may want an introduction, uh, that, that aren't going to sit through the 10 hours of the podcast, you know, here's a, here's a, like you said, a concise, cogent yeah. overview of the big picture and how, uh, it's, it's going to relate to what we're, what we're in the middle of now. Have them yeah. do and, a six uh, hour. You know, yeah. It's not it's only six it's, hours. <laughs> it's the price of a, well, it's the price of a, uh, you know, taking somebody to a movie these days. So yeah. So yeah, once again, that's January 27th and yeah. Thursday, January 27th, 20th. I didn't say February the first Sunday, time. February 20th. Correct. And, yeah. and that'll all be coming out. That just got uh, released uh, with links to buy the tickets uh, or to buy your access through HowTube in the, our most recent newsletter came out January one here. So if you aren't signed up for that, there'll be a, there'll be several more announcements and uh, definitely through the, the different social media channels also. And I'll add that the, the revenue generated from this is going to go into upgrading everything that we're doing. Yeah. Creating more and better content and quality of content. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be streamed live. So people who are tuning in live will be able to interact with each other as they're watching. 
which should be fun. That's always mm-hmm. fun. And uh, yeah, you can buy tickets. Eighteen. It's eighteen. If you buy, it's eighteen dollars per uh, episode. If you buy them separately, or thirty three if you buy them both up front. So there Correct. you go. And there should yep. be. We'll, we'll put links in the show notes for this, probably. Right, Brad. Absolutely. Go check it out. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, uh, also, yeah. And I'd like to put in a, an endorsement again for CBD from the gods. You know, I've been having some trouble with my back last week and, um, I tell you what, getting Julie to give me some massages with that oil on my lower back where I've had some inflammation. Yes, sir. In fact, I had her give me one earlier, so I'd be up to doing this podcast here tonight, right now. Otherwise, I might be stretched out on the couch right now instead, feeling sorry for myself. You know, I've been mostly taking the oil, but I'm finding now more and more that, you know, and I've started, I'm going to see how it works on my right knee, you know, because those years of carpentry work, I did a lot of kneeling on my right knee, and now it's, I can feel it in my right knee for the last year or so. So I haven't been applying the salve to my right knee, but I'm going to start doing that every day and see what happens. So anyways, yeah. Uh, and, and go check out their website. It's really interesting. You can see a video about how the, uh, a really well done video about how they process the plants and uh, how they, they cultivate the plants, how they process them, how they extract the oils and things from it. Quite interesting, and you get to know the the people behind the product better, and um, so yeah, go just go to the website uh, uh, CBD from the Gods, check it out. And I just put a plug in for the for the gummies, uh, you know, a little quick chewable or let it melt in your mouth, you know, pretty quick effect, just very calming. If you're going through some stressful stuff or. Uh, you just need to chill a bit, or if you're going to drive and traffic drives you nuts like it does to me when I go to Atlanta, um, those gummies are great. Helps with the road rage, folks. It yes, totally, and totally. I, I found when when things get a little too chaotic and there's too much noise around, I tape the gummies. I can just insert one into each ear, and um, that solves the problem. You know, I'm trying to sleep. There's too much background noise. Straight to the brain. <laughs> yes, strawberry's best for that. So, hey, you know what? I said that in jest, but hmm, might might give that a try. I might actually try it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have tried one up each nostril. That works very well too. <laughs> so. Protect against COVID. <laughs> you might want to put an ant trap on your shoulder then. All right. So, um, enough with the levity. So let's look at uh, some. We'll do some share screen here um, so people can get the geological context of what we're talking about here. All right. So here are the maritime provinces of Canada, and you can see, you know, Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. So there you can see Fredericton, the town right there uh, that we're referred to in the, um, in the narratives. And I think, Let's see. Yeah, there's a map kind of showing with it. It was roughly within this circle that these great fires uh, occurred. And from what I was able to reconstruct from reading the uh, various accounts and things, we can conclude that a minimum of this right here is where uh, several of the fires. Now, this doesn't even include the fires that broke out simultaneously in Maine, but there was a fire that broke out, you know, like I said, near Fre- Fredericton, and it burned very rapidly to the north. And then there was separate fires that started in these other locations. Now, whether they um, merged into one firestorm or not, I was not able to ascertain from the sources I had available to me. I put this together. Now, bear in mind that the um, uh, fire from the sky was done in 1996. So a lot of this, now I've updated this, of course, since then, but a lot of this was going back to the information that I had available in 1996. And, you know, it was much more, I mean, in the interim, you know, we've seen the emergence of the internet. You know, I'd never been on the internet in 1996, so I didn't have access to any of that stuff. And so, um, you know, a lot of the material that I acquired was doing research for the documentary, 
which was uh, broadcast, I think it was March 23rd on 1997, which coincidentally was the day that Comet Hale-Bopp made its very closest passage to Earth. And I might have told that story, but I just briefly, you know, I'd been working with the producer, um, and he had spent months trying to sell the idea to major networks and, uh, had, had nobody had, had was seemed to be too interested. The idea that, you know, cause I, had, they had basically come to me like a year before, uh, my name had been dropped as somebody who might have some ideas for a documentary that they wanted to do. And so once we had our initial meeting, um, the, uh, the producer Rex Hauk decided that, yeah, maybe this would be a pretty good story to tell. So the idea was to talk about the role of great impacts in earth history. Right. And the documentary was produced and there was a seg a section of it, uh, about halfway through or three quarters of the way through where I appeared for maybe five minutes and talked about some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about here. And, um, one of the things that we did was we went up to the Peshtigo, Wisconsin, which is one of the fires we're going to be talking about here. And, uh, I visited the fire museum there and old Robert, I forget his last name now. Um, I'm sure he's passed away now because he had to have been well into his eighties back in 1996, but he had been curator of the fire museum there in Peshtigo for decades. So he gave me access to a lot of these unpublished eyewitness accounts. Now those were not available at any other place back then, but now maybe, I don't know. I haven't even looked to see if any of those accounts have made their way onto the internet or not. But when we did this, um, and put this together, at least this particular segment of, uh, the, the, of the program, uh, there was not a lot available without actually going to a place like the fire museum and accessing their archives. So anyways, you know, going back to 1825, it's even more difficult to find original material. But this kind of gives you the, the general idea of where these, these fires were in New Brunswick that we've just been talking about. So you asked on the break, uh, I think was, was it unknown? Maybe you asked before the break about the, the purple sky. Yeah, we were talking about the purple sky and then the aurora like Yeah. Phenomena. So... Again, this is going back to um, Holbrook's, Stuart Holbrook's work, uh, Burning an Empire. So this is um, from the book, Burning an Empire, which may or may not, I haven't even looked. Maybe, Kyle, you might look, see if it's still published, still available. I don't know. It was a really interesting read, though. So uh, he's going on, he's talking about one of the, um, one of the eyewitnesses. And, um, this is quite interesting. It's available on Amazon. All right. Well, I wonder what, what the latest publication date. Hardcover is $56. So it's currently of, unavailable. So <laughs> currently no. unavailable. Okay. Is there a well, digital version? I can, I'll try to find if it's. Also, I found the fire museum online, so they may have. Yeah. 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 So a lot of that stuff is probably online now. Yeah, this is 1943. Yeah. Well, that's what I said too. Remember? Oh, but let me. Uh, let me also issue a correction. I, I, earlier, I mispronounced Manistee, so I want to correct that. I don't want anybody from Manistee jumping on my case because I know how it's pronounced, okay? But I just uh, misspoke, which I do every few years. All right, let's get down uh, back to the story. So William Coney, William Coney, apparently an eyewitness to portions of the great fires along the Miramichi said that on the 7th, the 7th of October, a sickly mist tinged with purple emerged from the forest and settled over everything. Then note carefully. Now the time around nine o'clock, a succession of loud roars thundered through the forest Peel after peal, Coney said, crash after crash, announced the sentence of destruction. And the river itself, tortured into violence by the hurricane, 
foamed with rage and flung its boiling spray upon the land. Presently there came a stillness when all nature seemed hushed, and then a long and sullen roar came booming through the forest. Within a few minutes, the settlements of Newcastle and Douglastown, the only two places mentioned by this witness, had been utterly destroyed. Within a few minutes. As people hear this, I want you to try to imagine and try to visualize what's being described in your mind, okay? Um, I think that will uh, amplify the, the, the comprehension of, of these things that these people went through. It is not difficult to understand how many people thought all of New Brunswick was on fire and much of Nova Scotia and Maine. As one quaint old account has it, the whole forest world appeared to be in flames. It was a terrifying night, said one unnamed poet who went through it. All it required to complete a picture of the general judgment was the blast of a trumpet, the voice of the archangel, and the resurrection of the dead. And this is from a work called These Are the Maritimes by Will R. Byrd. And each one of these different narratives kind of throws a slightly different perspective, adds a few different details to help us get the, the full picture of, of what happened. It was supposed that an extensive forest fire was raging. Um, oh, also, this was published in 18, uh, shortly after the fire. It was supposed that an extensive forest fire was raging and there had been a long period of dry heat. But strangely, not a person seemed to be alarmed. And the reason they weren't alarmed, as we'll find out through many of these accounts, is that it was normal for fires to be burning throughout the forests in these days. I mean, Remember now, this is, this is early, and you figure 1825. So now this is in a period where um, the Europeans have only recently displaced many of the Native American inhabitants. Now, I don't know specifically about this area, but the practice was very widespread of the Native American inhabitants burning off, regularly burning off the undergrowth and the underbrush, which helped to, to uh, eliminate the, the buildup of a fuel load. And, you know, what happened with the uh, advent of, uh, you know, the Forest Service and the management of the forests by the government, there became this long period of trying to suppress forest fires. And native the, the tradition of burning off, regularly burning off the undergrowth uh, was interrupted for decades. And so many of the North American forests began to accumulate large uh, deposits of of um, dried branches and leaves and things that helped to the fires to become really extra hot and allowed them to climb up the trunks of the trees into the crowns of the trees. And if this was accompanied by you know extreme meteorological events, wind and uh, storms and things, it could rapidly propagate the fire through the through the uh, the crowns of the trees. But um, so in 1825. It's one of the things is that it's probably likely that many of these forests are not really um, like they became a century later or a century and a half later. Um, there was probably only very sparse undergrowth. And so typically every year, as, and as you read about the history of these fires, this is one of the things I learned is that every year there would be these kind of natural brush fires that would burn off the the undergrowth. And so people were used to seeing this and knew that this was a natural part of how the ecology worked. Even without having a science of ecology, they knew that this was part of what kept the catastrophic fires from, from occurring. Um, so that's why it says that not a person seemed to be alarmed. And the reason they weren't alarmed was because this was, you know, the normal 
uh, sequence of events that there would be these, um, these sort of these, these long, slow burning fires. However, then something changed in the evening, the breeze smartened and all at once ashes and cinders showered down and almost suffocated those outside their homes. An hour later, a loud roaring was heard and the falling ashes darkened the area and nothing could be seen. Then the wind blew a hurricane and the roaring noise became tremendous. Flames burst in masses from darkness and then the whole sky was illuminated by an immense sheet of fire that in a moment enveloped Newcastle and Douglastown. Within three minutes from the first appearance of flames, most of the houses in that area were on fire. Now the air had a smoky smell, and all the world seemed darker for that amazing... No, okay, I'm back up. This is from uh, the account of Jesse E. Lincoln, um, who recorded the story of a Louis Boubier who witnessed the fire as a boy. That's from the book, Through Flame and Tempest. Now the air had a smoky smell and all the world seemed darker for that amazing and yet dull light in the West. And, and, and you'll see that they're all pretty much describing very similar things, the darkness that came over, um, uh, the, 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 the odd light, the, the, the mist, all of these things are very interesting uh, details. Then, as sudden almost as a flash of lightning, a great sheet of fire rose over the top of the hill Immediately, other sheets of flame streamed up into the sky, around to the west and northwest. In an instant, all was as bright as day. It was the most terrifying sight which I ever witnessed. Everyone who saw it shouted or screamed. It seemed as if the whole town cried out at once. Dogs barked and howled. Horses snorted and galloped, cattle lowed and bawled in as great a terror as the people. Some shouted, it's the judgment day. The world is on fire. The judgment day has come. Many cried and some fell on their knees praying aloud. So frightened that I knew not what to do, I stood staring at the flames that darted far up into the sky behind the hill. Now, I, I, as I'm envisioning that, I'm thinking of this verse from the second chapter of Acts, verse 6. It says, Now when this noise, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. The following account of the great Miramichi fire is said to have been written by an eyewitness, a sister, probably the eldest, in case you were wondering, Russ, of Samuel Thompson and the daughter of the Reverend James Thompson, who was a Presbyterian minister at the time of the fire. The wind blew a violent hurricane from the northwest and brought with it from Douglas Town and Newcastle and the surrounding country such, such immense clouds of flames and ashes that it became extremely difficult to retain any position or even to breathe. At Chatham, the appearance of the heavens was awful, representing as far as the eye was capable of extending one unvariable body of flames, the effect of which was frightfully increased from the appalling roar of the fire in all quarters, the wind blowing with such violence as to occasion the air to resound with one incessant thunder. About nine o'clock, or shortly thereafter, a succession, and this is from the Miramichi, the history of the Miramichi by Esther Clark Wright. And um, 
This is what she says about, note again the time, about nine o'clock or shortly after a succession of loud and appalling roars thundered throughout the woods. Peal after peal, crash after crash, the tremendous bellowing became more and more terrific. The harmony of creation appeared to have been deranged and about to revert into original chaos. The river, tortured into violence by the hurricane, formed with rage and flung its boiling spray upon the land. The thunder pealed along the vault of heaven. The lightning rent the firmament in pieces. For a moment, and all was still. A deep and awful silence reigned over everything. All nature appeared to be hushed into dumbness. When, suddenly, a lengthened and sullen roar came booming through the forest and driving a thousand massive and devouring flames before it. For those of you who don't know, which I didn't, I looked it up. Peel is uh, to sing, chime, or otherwise make noise in a loud, clear, and vibrant manner. I was wondering peel what this peel after, after peel. peel. Yeah. I, I've never heard the phrase, so there you go. Uh-huh. I was just thinking they were peeling out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think probably a lot of them were trying to peel out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the um, sources was this, I think I mentioned his name earlier, Robert Cooney. Um, he was chief clerk in one of the mercantile establishments in Miramichi. He went into news work and eventually became a Wesley, Wesleyan Methodist parson. Um, so he wrote a book called a compendious history of the Northern part of the province of New Brunswick. And in this book, he says that the fire extended, um, 6,000 miles of country became enveloped in an immense sheet of flame. Uh, from the Ganang papers, New Brunswick provincial archives, now this is where it gets a little grim, people, but we're gonna we're gonna get into it. All right. Of a family, now this is some of the the aftermath of the fire here. Of a family of nine in number, not one escaped, and out of another, seven perished. Some had their heads burnt off. Some their brains exposed to view. Some their bowels bursting out while all other parts of their bodies were burnt as though it were tinder, and others were so much burnt that the human form could scarcely be distinguished. And back to Jesse Lincoln's uh, accounts. Among the old people at Miramichi, the date from which events in local history are reckoned is the Great Fire. Such and such occurrence happened the year before the fire, or four years after the fire. So they say with simple unconsciousness that the visitor may not know what they mean. I remember that day very well, for it seemed hotter than any before it. All the afternoon the sun was as red as blood, and looked larger than I ever saw it before or since. Grandmother Boubier was still all the time going to and fro and often stood long at the door of our house looking at the sky. Yeah, the omens, right? Like I said earlier. Yeah, she's recognizing it, yeah. Yeah. Toward night, we believed that a rainstorm was at hand for a great black bank of cloud rose over the forest in the west. The sun went out of sight in it. The evening was very dark, for the cloud had risen over nearly all the sky. Yet in the west there was a light, the northern lights, some said, for we often saw them there and supposed they betokened a change of weather. It was a tawny kind of light, and I heard a lumberman say that it must come from woods on fire up the river. 
After a time, we outsiders heard a drum a good way off up the river, and some said that a platoon of soldiers was coming into town, or that a man of war had anchored in the bay. Also, a low rumbling noise, which we took to be distant thunder, came to us whenever the preacher stopped talking. As we went toward home, this roaring noise sounded more plainly and seemed too steady for thunder. I thought it was a shower coming from the other side of the hill and ran home. It roared strangely, and the wild light in the west looked very strange, too. But of all the strange sights, the strangest was the forms of animals vaguely outlined on the hilltop against the queer light. Animals that we believed were deer and bears coming from the woods. Now the air had a smoky smell, and all of the world seemed darker for that amazing and yet dull light in the west. Then as sudden, almost as a flash of lightning, a great sheet of fire rose over the top of the hill. Immediately, other sheets of flame streamed up into the sky, around to the west and northwest. In an instant, all was as bright as day. And I won't go, I've already read part of that. He says, um, So frightened that I knew not what to do, I stood staring at the flames that darted far up into the sky behind the hill. The new church on the top of the hill burst into flame and in a moment was all ablaze. Till this, we had felt no wind. But then a tornado struck the place suddenly. Boards, beams, and shingles from the church all ablaze were whirled high into the air and fell over the whole village. The sky seemed full of flaming clouds, for such was the violence of the wind that great branches from pine trees along the hilltop were twisted off and carried hundreds of feet into the air. Like birch bark, they burned, and wherever they fell, they wrapped houses, mills, and lumber piles in flames. In three minutes, all Newcastle was on fire, and the people, many of them in their night clothes, fled shrieking, some toward the river, some toward the marsh. In less than an hour, the town, and also the surrounding forest, was wholly burned up. And so great had been the fury of the fire that there were few smoldering beams or trees left behind. All were burned up at once. Of, of our houses, nothing remained save a few white ashes. The entire Miramichi country was a blackened desert. Its great pine forests had disappeared. Literally nothing was left except ashes. And but for the kindly supplies of breadstuffs sent us from other districts of the province and from the United States, a great many of the survivors would have died from starvation during the following winter. Man, that's just crazy. Yeah. So this is in October, and they have, I mean, it's getting cold already. They're, they have nothing. They. What yeah. do you burn? What do you, how do you make a fire when everything's been burnt? Yeah. How do you keep yourself warm after all right. your fuel has gone in one day? They must have. They must have moved. They just somewhere. had a. They just had to bail. Yeah. Yeah. There were and other details. Go, so crazy. the New Brunswick fires covered some two million acres. Now, this is 2 million acres in a matter of a few hours. And without leaving, like, the, you know, according to that last account, because yeah. you, you see you see aftermaths of large forest fires sometimes in national parks and in some of the other places, and mm-hmm. the big trees, a lot of times their trunks are still there. They may be dead. Yeah. Well, But the, you blacken I, trunks, but these people are like, nope, there's a flat desert of ash. There's and nothing. what you realize here is you think, oh, this is hyperbole. Well, no, it's not. And the reason yeah. how we know it's not is because even though there couldn't be photographs, in 1825. In 1883, in the aftermath of the Hinckley fire, photographs were taken. Yeah. And I will show you some of these photographs and you okay. will see that where these great pine forests stood, there's nothing. Nothing. A few stumps here and there, but yeah. yeah. 
Two million acres, by the way, is 3,125 square miles. Wow. Well, then that other estimate was 6,000 square miles. So somewhere within that range. So the New Brunswick fires covered some 2 million acres. Well, okay, so that's just the New Brunswick. That's so the, the forest, right? Yeah. So the Br- New Brunswick was a country rich in fish and game. Coney observes, quote now, myriads of salmon, trout, bass, and other fish, which, poisoned by the alkali formed by the ashes precipitated into the river, now lay dead or floundering and gasping on the scorched shores and beaches. The countless variety of wildfowl and reptiles shared a similar fate. I myself heard old men report that their fathers had seen the toll of game and that it had, that it had been terrible. Yeah. More game, it was said, was killed by the Miramichi and other fires in 1825 than had previously been killed since white men came. But this is a way of trying to make something specific out of the tales that have been handed down of carcasses of deer and moose and bear so thick that one could hardly walk between them. The Miramichi fire still stands as the greatest forest conflagration of the Northeastern Atlantic seaboard. Since the Younger Dryas. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. So then we're going to jump to head to 1871 and we're going to see that uh, one of the great coincidences in American history. Okay. So this is now um, from the book Wall of Flames by Lawrence H. Larson, which was published by the North Dakota Institute or regional studies. Kyle, I'm sure you, you've probably read that several times. I'm sure. Uh, I'm a guest author. On the, yes. I, uh, helped you were write one of, the, it. one of the reviewers here. Yeah. I was also editor. Ah, okay. So this is uh, from, let's see, this is like getting into the Great Chicago Fire, which most everyone has heard, at least, Semi-educated people in my generation at least had heard of the Great Chicago Fire. But you guys have heard of that, right? Before any before we even met, probably you'd heard of it, right? Yep. It's it's pretty well known. I mean, it's the most well known urban fire in American history. Yeah. And I, I had even read quite a bit about how it was mis- it was really sort of mysterious how it start got started because it was too widespread, but you know, you're taking so you 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 don't believe it was Mrs. O'Leary's cow? <laughs> right. No. <laughs> well, it's come out now recently that Mrs. O'Leary's cow had been arrested previously for arson. For arson, so, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> it's... Uh, I had heard that it had burned a ho- outhouse down the night before, but that isn't <laughs> conclusive proof that it set the entire city on fire the next day. That's right. <laughs> okay. So this is from Wall of Flames, Lawrence H. Larson. Firestorms caused major havoc in North America during the 19th century. No one had the means to predict when and where one would occur. After all, fires broke out daily for years in Chicago prior to Mrs. O'Leary's obstinate cow supposedly kicking over a lantern. And the kind of climatic conditions that prevailed on that Chicago evening of October 8th, 1871, hot and oppressively muggy with a brisk brisk southwestern wind, were not unusual during Indian summer of the Midwest. The O'Leary fire differed because, for unknown reasons, its convection tower fought up through the inversion and became a wave of flames that moved across the Windy City, burning the downtown district and the docks and destroying over 40,000 dwellings. 46 years earlier, almost to the day, on the 7th of October, 1825, a similar fire ravaged New Brunswick in the Maritimes, burning 10,000 out of 25,000 miles of territory. 
Ah, so here we have now, we're coming forward to more, more evidence uh, has been amassed. And notice how the area consumed by the Miramichi fires, the, the, the New Brunswick fires, has now increased um, up to 10,000 miles of territory. That is a lot of acres. Yeah. Like, how many acres would that be, Kyle? 10,000 square miles. Yeah. So what, I mean, what he was saying there is that the, the Tower of Flame punched through the inversion layer. And the inversion layer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And we're going to come back to that. We're going to come right. back to specific meteorological conditions that seem to have been prevalent. All right. During six, six million, four hundred thousand acres, six million, four hundred thousand acres. Okay. So now think about this. Six million, four hundred thousand. This is basically in a day. Now, yeah. as bad as some of the modern firestorms and fire forest fires have been, and we're being told repeatedly that they're unprecedented evidence of the climate crisis. And people are led to believe that there have never been fires of this magnitude before. I think this material that we're looking at here contradicts that interpretation. Six million acres, 10,000 square miles. Um, so yeah, it's like 100 miles by 100 miles. Yeah. Now he goes on here. For days prior to the disaster, fires in the forests and air charged with wood smoke had caused little apprehension. They were considered a necessary part of land clearance projects, right? And then with startling suddenness, the flames merged in mid-morning into a most impetuous hurricane that quickly did its terrible work. So again, we find some of these same ideas again is that People were living in forests where small-scale fires were a regular part of the landscape. And so the existence of such fires didn't seem to uh, elicit any greater degree of apprehension than normal, right? And, and again, as we, as we go through these narratives, you see how, how, how things suddenly change and how quickly, how quickly the, the, the event um, you know, occurred and, and enveloped these people, you know, how they were, um, basically going about their business. And then there were these omens that we talked about. Also the idea that just prior to the outbreak, this idea of these, if you want to use the term preternatural calm that prevailed, the quiet, this is part of it also. Can I throw in a, absolutely. Uh, based on your previous comment, so the 2020 California wildfire season was uh, one of the, the largest wildfire season recorded in California's modern history. Uh, 9,917 fires had burned basically 4,400,000 acres. So over, the whole, the, over the whole fire season. Over the whole year, yeah. Uh, over yeah. all, almost 10,000 fires. Yeah. And so they're saying that that it that's the largest in recorded modern history, though roughly equivalent to the pre eighteen hundred levels, which averaged about four point four million acres yearly and up to twelve million in peak years. Yeah, but what they're not saying is that in some of the cases, those fires were concentrated within a matter of a day or two. Yeah, right. That's a a fact that uh, I think we should uh, emphasize here. Um. Okay, so this is... But, um, but yeah, go, before you continue sure. on, because you were talking about, you know, what's leading up, we see these common elements. And to me, it's... Well, the, the first, the interesting thing about Grandma looking out the d window, right, or yeah. out the door, she keeps going back to the door and she's looking out there because the sun's red, the sky's weird, yeah. Yeah. things are strange. She's getting, you know, you can tell she's she thinks something's wrong. Yeah. But you get this purple sky, then you get these booming noises. Like a series of reports, like mm -hmm. uh, or artillery, making people think, yeah, that there's some, you know, yeah, they're they're described as drums or guns, peel. right? There's peals, there's peals. <laughs> then there's this silence and this weird light in the sky, and uh -huh. then this slowly developing roaring sound, and animals start showing up. Yeah, 
And then, like, what really struck me when you were when you were telling everybody, like, try to picture this in your mind, and you were doing these descriptions. What really struck me was when I realized that they were saying the flames towered up into the sky from behind the hill. Right, because if uh-huh. you, if you're standing right next to a b- really large fire, it can look like it's going way up into the sky. But if you have to look over a hill and it still looks like it's going way up into the sky, then it's a big fire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> and the other thing is, is like they were hearing those roaring noises and seeing the strange light in the sky, which I started to think of. I wonder if that's there's dark clouds or smoke or something, and the firelight is reflecting off that, and it's just really strange looking. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Uh, like if you have low lying clouds or mist and there's a huge fire that's very distant, the light from that fire reflecting off those clouds might look really weird because it's moving, flickering. Sure, sure. So, well, as we go through working our way through these narratives of these other fires, we'll we'll be seeing the parallels. Okay, you know, and and yeah, when when we're all done with this, we'll try to make some sense out of it. Not all that right. we necessarily will, but we'll give it a try anyway. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Uh, The History of the Great Fire in Chicago. Uh, The Great Fires in Chicago and the West. It was published right afterwards. Uh, So, uh, oh, no, yeah, History of the Great Chicago Fire was published. Let me see if I got the year here. Um, And this is just going to be a tease for the next show because we're getting close to wrapping up. Yeah, yeah, we'll just start, get get a little bit into the Chicago Fire, and then next, next episode we'll... Continue. We're going to talk about then the Peshtigo fire, the Hinckley fire, and um, the great burn of 1910, where um, Brad and I have been through the town of Wallace, Idaho, a couple of times, and that was right at the center of this conflagration, and it was completely eliminated from creation. By the big this, burn. By the big burn, yeah. So we're going to talk about that in the next episode. But we'll get, we'll get, start, uh, get a start. Uh, into the um, story of the Great Chicago Fire. So, here we go. Among the saddest events of history will rank the conflagration which began in Chicago and raged with unchecked violence, consuming more than one half the city, destroying hundreds of millions of property, occasioning large loss of life, and making homeless 100,000 purpose. Up uh, one one hundred thousand persons. Excuse me. This renewal of the fire, or as it really was, an independent conflagration, began at nine p.m. on Sunday night. Now this is October eighth. So one day after the Miriam, almost one day to the year, same time of night. Okay. Um, the whole business portion of the south and north sides of the city were laid in ruins and nothing, nothing resisted the appalling fury of the wasting element. Fireproofs were consumed as in a moment the flames lapped over whole blocks and across the river. When everything was licked up and devoured by the fire fiend, people were caught in their dwellings and burned or were overtaken on the streets and destroyed. And only when the city was consumed in the track of the hurricane did the elemental war cease. For days, the fire smoldered, and night after night, the heavens glowed like the canopy of hell and threatened universal destruction. And here's from the narrative of uh, George M. Higginson, uh, The History of Chicago from the Earliest Period to the Present Time, Volume 2, published in 1885. As I opened the front door, I saw the cinders falling like flakes of snow in a storm. As I looked to the south, The sky over the city was a bright red glowing like a furnace and studded with innumerable sparks, ignited cinders and blazing embers shining like myriads of red stars. But I could see no flames nor even smoke, 
Indeed, the absence of smoke from any point of view I had of the fire was a notable characteristic, which I attributed to the intensity of the heat. It seemed as if I were alone in the city, that the last day had come, and the final conflagration of all things created was at hand. Again, we find this, this apocalyptic sense that people feel like the day of judgment, the end of the world, this is it. You know, that somehow this is outside the bounds of normal experience, right? All the elements of nature are in chaos, right? This is from, also from the history of Chicago, the account of Elias Colbert. Everyone has read, if he did not himself pass through the horrible experience how, this is, this is important, how the very air itself seemed full of fire, how the flames seemed to take giant leaps of many hundreds of yards, breaking out in points far away from the scenes of general disaster, and how huge balloons of flames swept through the sky to descend and break like a burning water spout, licking up every vestige of human life and labor from open clearings to which many had fled as to a haven of safety. In the process, devastating flames were kindled afresh in hundreds of places so far removed from the previous locality of the fire that it seemed as if the havoc could only have been wrought by the torch of the destroying angel. And here I want you to recall an image, right? Yeah, and in fact, reference. And I think, why not? I will share that image again. Man. The end of the show. Yeah, we but gotta wrap. We gotta wrap it up. I just want to know, like, <laughs> what can make well, a giant ball of fire fly out and then just burst on a field? Yeah, fly out of the fire. Right. So I was gonna say this at the end here. Ugh. We've we spent two years lighting very large fires. Sometimes <laughs> we, we were clearing people's property. Uh, for them. And so there were huge piles of trees. Sometimes we had to burn huge. Most of the time they were small, but on occasion you get the chance to burn a lot because it's wet or whatever. So I've been around humongous fires and they can do really weird stuff when the wind picks up and things change uh, and they can get really scary. But I've never seen huge globes of flame leave the fires we lit and fly somewhere and set other stuff on fire, you know. Yeah. So, but yes, fire does weird stuff when it's large. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I guess you're but, seeing this, the Eon or yes. Aeon, the God of time and fiery destruction in the Mithraic tradition. Yeah. Wielding the torches of Ekperusis. <laughs> and is he breathing flame onto that altar? Oh, is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Not only was he wielding torches, he was breathing flame. Ah, uh, okay. So, Fire breathing dragon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we got we got to wrap it up here. So, well, hell, let's wrap it up then, and we'll uh, uh, provoking. Yes, for sure. Fascinating stuff, and and you know, scary. So, we warned yeah. about the R rating coming. Yeah. All so, right. okay, well, we, we, you know, that's as good a place as any to stop for now and, yeah. you know, then, then pick up the story, um, in the next episode. Um, well, you've sparked my interest. <laughs> <laughs> well put Kyle. Yes. I'm hoping that I sparked the interest of a few more folks that might be listening in. Um, so yeah, it's in, and, and the story is actually, I know it's, been quite compelling up to this point, but it actually is going to get even more interesting. All right. Because yeah. when we get into the Chicago fire, the Peshtigo fire, the Hinkley fire and the big burn, we have 
much, we have a, a much greater database to work from being much more recent events in history. So the question we'll be asking is, are these normal fires or is there something else going on? It doesn't what sound do you say, normal. Mike? <laughs> You're the <Normal>. expert. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I the expert? Do I look at all? We're like asking you if it's normal. <laughs> Normality. Uh, oh, well, normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why I don't know. Sounds, sounds pretty suspicious to me. Suspicious. Right, okay, I'll we'll I'll buy that for now. That that'll. Yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with that for now. Normal guy says these fires sound suspicious. <laughs> They're not normal. It, so if normal normal guy thinks this is suspicious, what do the rest of us um, fringe <laughs> crank pot crack pots think? <laughs> aliens. It's definitely no, obviously aliens. aliens. <laughs> yeah, auspicious. So hey, uh, one more. Long awaited announcement coming in February, right? Randall on the the Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> no, that's not it. Wait, who's that guy? He's really big right now. He's got all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe Rogan experience. That's right. With Randall Carlson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got a you got a solid date. Let's still. I think we're looking at February fourth. Right on. Awesome. Yeah. Can't oh. wait. It's going to be a good show, that's for sure. Yeah. Looking I forward to drum it. roll for a month. Yeah, I'm a little bit nervous about it, only because, um, you know, I'm like, how much should I, how much should I let out of the bag, and how much should I hold back? I just don't know. Maybe I should just go all out. Just, just go. no holding back. Yeah, no, Come on, no holding back. You but think don't that? screw it up. <laughs> just bring a really big bag. <laughs> No need to be nervous. Just don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're really excited. No, I can't wait. Joe, Joe's been knocking it out of the park recently, and so yeah. have you. So I think it'll be, it's going to be great, Joe. Yeah, yeah really I think good. it'll be fun. It'll, it'll yeah. be great fun to hang with Joe again. Yeah. Is it, is it going to be just you, or are you going to have another guest on? No, just me. Cool. Just me. Me and Joe. Well, all your work. Rogan appearances have been great. Yeah. So I don't see why we should expect any less. All right. It's going to be great. All the Randall he can handle. That's right. So, uh, so yeah, it ought to be Carlson, good. RandallCarlson.com for stuff on that. And then newsletter letter, right? People should join, sign up for the newsletter to get updates on everything because you guys, are, well, there's there's all kinds of stuff happening. Yeah. More so, stuff And happening. we'll continue, yeah. So RandallCarlson.com slash newsletter. And uh, you get that in your inbox 8 a.m. first Saturday every month. So um, that's the best way to keep up with all the new stuff. Uh, we're trying to be current with it here, but, uh, we get flip flop time wise. We're totally caught up right now, but, uh, yeah, more Randall reports, more Randall responds, more Randall reveals, more live stream podcasts. So yeah, we're really trying to jam on all this with Randall in 2022. What are we going to do? Randall relapses. <laughs> and he does Randall all, all relapses the followed by Randall recovers. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> and we, we got Randall remembers in there too. Yeah, remembers. So yeah, we're rants, rages. Rant. <laughs> 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 well, the good day, thing about that day. is the good thing about that is uh, we only need to use the one logo. That's right. <laughs> so That's right. <laughs> yeah, Rue. All right, guys. All right. Great show. Good, powerful stuff. Yeah. yeah. See you next time. Thank All right. I'm um, looking forward to good it. Night. Good night. Good night. That's really good shit, Randall.